I thought rather than talk about um, the things that I've noticed um, through the creative work that I've done, and if you know of it, um, rather sort of step away from that and, and talk about uh, the things I suppose I've, I've learnt or kind of felt important to me um, in, I suppose, business and uh, life, uh, the things I've learned about working with people and, um, and, um, and, and pleasure and leisure and all those kind of things because I think in life, uh, you know, so many things can actually constrain you and uh, creativity is all about, you know, a free mind. And um, so this isn't going to be anything about, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not an expert on political freedom or, um, or uh, you know, things like that. So it's, it's really, um, I suppose, really just all about the things I've kind of learned. And I kind of feel that the computer is a, bit of a, um, is a bit of a prison, really. I mean, everyone stands up and plugs their laptop in and you watch a presentation and you try and concentrate on what they're saying and then looking at something. So today I thought I'd go with the flow with the, uh, of the theme, which is freedom, and um, involve you all in this presentation. So. I can see there's a mild look of terror on some people. Um, and this presentation is about freedom, it's going to free flow. I've got some subjects that I um, thought were, might be interesting for you to learn about or hear about. And I'm, the way I'm going to do this is I've written the, 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 the titles of these subjects. They're actually short stories, really. Um, there's 11 of them. I'm not going to get through all of them. And I'm going to pass out some boards um, to the audience now. You're going to pass them around. And if you see something that you like, you hold onto the board. And I don't want to have any boards come back to me, so start passing those. You can look at them and uh, start passing them back. So hold onto a board if you like the look of the title. And, um, and the speech, the talk, the talk this morning, you're going to have to pass them back quite quickly, um, is, uh, is going to be dictated by who's prepared to stand up and call out the uh, the title of the short story that's on the board and if we can get through um, as many as possible within 20-25 minutes um, that will be that will be great we're not going to get through all of them but uh, it'll be determined by who wants to sort of stand up and shout first so with no more ado it's over to you the floor is free who's going to start you got to stand up. up what is it the chat up the chat up okay so this is a story um, about uh, Pearl Fisher, my company. Um, and we started in 1992, and uh, kind of like was three of us, and we kind of did some good work, and we kind of did some, got, got quite a good reputation. And then I suppose about eight, nine years into it, we, we hit some roadblocks, and uh, we started to feel very constrained. And, um, and that was in the sense that there was so much competition around, so many other designers. We had reached a point of sort of just really kind of be becoming sort of, instead of like being fresh and new, we were just like kind of part of the kind of the, uh, you know, the wallpaper really. And, um, and it was, and it was a, a sort of a moment when you suddenly realize actually, you know, how am I going to keep on surviving this? How am I going to go in and win a project? against all these other agencies or designers that are out there and how do I stand out in, the, in this world of sort of like pretty much kind of blandness, you know, that is, that is out there when you have so many, um, you know, so many people doing what you do, it automatically sort of brings everything down. And so we needed to sort of free ourselves. We wanted to free ourselves if there was a way of, um, of kind of this, this shackles that were kind of like beginning to hold us back and, and, um, and sort of really uh, not helping us fulfill our dreams and ambitions and desires. So um, we, uh, I got some guys in that, that uh, I really value, um, a guy called Martin Farrell and William Morn, and they, are, they describe themselves as um, creative clairvoyance. And uh, they came in and they sort of talked about kind of, um, you know, what we wanted to, to achieve and they, and what I wanted to achieve. And basically I wanted to move my team out of the kind of the status quo. They were kind of almost getting a bit comfortable. Uh, everyone knew there was a problem. There were frustrations developing in terms of the way that we weren't able to kind of like sit, uh, fulfill our potential. 
So Martin and, and William said, leave it with us. And, we, and uh, the next thing we knew was we all got invitations to, um, and I say we all, it was like a select group. There was about um, seven of us. We got inv invitations to a hotel, um, a nice luxury hotel. And we all had to turn up one morning. And we turned up, and uh, there was fresh coffee waiting for us and everything like that. And then we were ushered up to the marital suite. So there were seven of us, um, quite senior creatives, all being and strategists and you know the managing director and everything, all ushered up to the you know the honeymoon suite, and um, and there we were given some champagne and told to mingle. And being seven of us, it was quite awkward at that point, um, being in an environment that was not uh, not usual for us, and um, and then we were led through into the um, the actual bedroom, the honeymoon suite. And uh, we were all told to get onto the bed. And now, you know, you've got to remember there are like men and women at this different ages, you know. But, you know, they're all working for us. And, um, and we all had to get onto the bed. And of course, that's a very uncomfortable moment when you get onto a bed with people that you work with in a very, uh, you know, at like 10 a.m. in the morning. And you've had like some coffee and now you're drinking champagne. And it just totally throws your mind. And, and then they hit us with probably one of the most um, interesting challenges that I've ever been faced with, which was we were told to chat the person up next to us. Could you chat the person up next to you? And you know, it was a, it was a roughly 50-50 um, mix of men and women. And um, you should have heard what was said. Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing was said because everyone was paralyzed by the moment. And they were also paralyzed by this, um, this realization that actually they'd forgotten how to actually chat somebody up, how to, um, how to say something in a very intimate environment that would actually um, engage with that person's mind. And, and it showed us something about ourselves um, that actually as a company we'd, we'd lost, we'd just forgotten the power of desirability. And, um, and I think in this world where there is so much choice and you know, if you're designers or creators or whatever is a, you know, you, you know that whatever business you're in, there is too much competition out there. And, and what is the best way to get business towards you? It's to, it's to make it come to you. And, uh, and you can only do that if you, if you have a sort of a, a magnetic kind of quality. And that is kind of desirability. And that, I learned that day, can be learned. You can learn how to be desirable and the importance of desirability. And I'm not talking about in a sexual sense, I'm talking about in, a, in an intellectual sense. And, and I've, I learned that actually the mind is the biggest erogenous zone. And if in life you can uh, um, appeal to the, um, you know, the, the mind um, and you, you learn how to transfer that into your, your business life and, uh, and in the things that you do, if, if you know, making a living and, and running a business or being part of a business or being successful is, is what you want to do. Appeal to the mind. And if you appeal to the mind, hearts will follow. Okay, next. Fear of making mistakes. Okay, so fear is an interesting um, subject for me. Um, because I, got, I was actually asked to do a whole talk on that about 10 years ago and, um, and it was kind of quite, quite a cathartic kind of experience because a bit like this, I hadn't really kind of uh, thought about it. But, but f mistakes uh, really, to be honest, I think is really the, the thing that is um, people's second biggest fear. Probably the, the, the primary fear is death or loss of a loved one. Um, but um, making mistakes, I think everyone doesn't want to make a mistake, it's kind of natural. Um, and really what this is about is, is about uh, risk, because risk is a kind of thing which makes you know, you, you people feel like, well I shouldn't go there because it's kind of risky. And, um, and I would say the opposite, especially in the world of creativity, that you know, risk is, uh, taking risks is the key to free thought, new ideas, originality. And, um, and, and I think that there is an interesting paradox that, that especially in the world of where things are being um, commissioned creatively, I, what I've noticed is, is that um, clients that commission a designer are often quite um, nervous about the creative outcome. And um, that's quite, that's a bit of a kind of a paradox really because they're actually asking for change and when they see it, they're nervous about the change. And interestingly, designers or creatives are um, really kind of like afraid of actually 
doing things that are outside of their kind of their their, their kind of peer reference group. So actually, what it creates is is actually more of the same. And what clients are worried about is actually sort of seeing change. And so the whole creative process is actually risk averse. And, um, and what needs to happen to unlock these kind of, uh, you know, the real possibilities for the future is how you can actually um, take risks in a way that is not reckless and not, um, you know, um, suggesting that recklessness is the way forward. But, but finding ways to create creative risks um, is massively important if you are going to push the envelope and deliver kind of great creative ideas. And, um, and I learned this when, on my, when I was a designer in the 80s, working for a very big design company called the Michael Peters Group. And um, it was kind of like mid to late 80s. And uh, I was working on a presentation that was pre-computers. And, um, and we used to do everything by hand then. If we were designing uh, identities, we'd draw the logos. If we were designing packaging, we would visualize the bottles. And then we would kind of put like rub downs on them. And, uh, and, um, and we were doing this presentation, it was finished late at night, and it was for a, um, an alcoholic cider brand. And so there were lots of, there were about six bottles all finished up, and they were looking pretty nice. And then we discovered we actually had a spare vo a bit, a bottle visual. And, um, and we also had some spare rub downs left over, some transfers. And, um, and it was me and the creative director at the time, we just kind of looked at this bottle, it was a beautiful black bottle, and we looked at some of the transfers and we thought, what happens if we take this bottle and we just cut out some of these transfers that would belong to the other designs and we just, at the last minute, assemble something? And so we set ourselves a creative challenge that within five minutes we'd create a new design. And out of all the, all the elements that were around us, so it was really an act of sort of randomness and we, we took a bit of a risk. And um, what came out of it was a very simple, uh, beautiful black bottle with a red K on it. And, um, and then we just put minimal typography on it from the left hand uh, rub downs. And that became, um, in the 80s and early 90s, the biggest selling cider and redefined a whole kind of category of premium cider at the time. And interestingly enough, that brand is still around and I see it lying in the gutters now, kind of crushed up in cans and thrown away. And it's, it's not the same brand it was, but that brand was, was, that design was chosen out of a moment of kind of randomness. And we took a risk to put things together and the client loved it at the last moment. So I, th I would sort of say that if you want to free yourself of kind of like the doing things in a conventional way, you've got to risk everything except your reputation. Letting go. Okay, letting go is a sort of a, um, is a, sort of a people kind of one here. Um, and it's really, I think, to, to, to do with what happens when you, um, when you develop as a, as a person, especially sort of professionally, and um, and you know, I started out as a junior designer, and then was very fortunate to be promoted up, and then I went to a New York um, late eighties, early nineties, and became a creative director. Um, went through huge change in my life in in um, in New York, and then after that, after three years, I came back to. London and set up my company and that was 22 years ago. And, and what I've noticed as I've sort of gone through that, those experiences is that um, every time I've sort of felt like I'm in a sort of comfortable position, actually there's another sort of voice inside my head that it's actually sort of time to let go of that comfortable position, to let, give room to people um, you know, coming up beneath us. And, um, and I, I really experienced that, I think, most viscerally um, in the sort of like the I don't know, mid 90s, around about that time that I was talking about where we were sort of, you know, getting into, you know, running up against a brick wall in terms of development. And um, I, I held the title of creative director. And a creative director kind of holds quite, you know, a lot of authority um, and, you know, dictates what, you know, what the outcome is. And, and yet I had a growing team, I had um, some very good talent around me. And, um, and I actually, the, 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 the voice at the back of my head, um, was actually sort of saying it's time to let go of that role or let someone else do that because if you really want to push, thing, uh, push things on um, then you will benefit from having sort of fresh people come in and, and sort of take on that role and look at it, look at it from a different point of view. But the, but the paranoia in me was about letting go. It was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, if I'd let go of the creative director role, what am I going to do? You know, I mean, you know, there's only so much room in this, in this, in this studio. And actually it was the most cathartic thing to do was to let go of that, um, that control and authority because it did allow someone to come in 
and make a very important kind of contribution to, to the company. He's now gone on to uh, run his own company and is a very successful designer. And, and I think that um, what it did for me, though, was actually allow me to kind of float free. And, um, and that floating free is tremendously cathartic because you don't just kind of like disappear. You're actually able to sort of see things in a different way and allows you to sort of progress as a, as a human being and, a, and as a person and to take all the things that you've learned and carry that with you as you go forward and, and, and really um, do, do new things with those things. So it's not like my creativity uh, left me and I became a lesser person. Um, it actually helped me actually develop as an, as an individual and by losing that control, shedding control and, and authority and giving it to somebody else freed me up to do actually other things and I think probably in life since that point I must let go of like what I do probably every three or four years um, and let other people sort of do that and I think it is a it's, it's tremendously cathartic for me because it allows me to move on to new things, try different things um, I, I now do a podcast, I kind of do some crazy stuff in my house in Dorset and I kind of like, you know, do lots of things with the company direction and I have a studio in, in New York now and all of these things are, um, are only possible because I decided to let go of those things and allowed myself to, to sort of develop as a person. And so when I see people struggling professionally, uh, especially senior people in my organisation, I, I, there comes a point when they become quite entrenched and I see it on the client side as well. And you can see it like the more senior they are, the more kind of like, no, this isn't the same with everyone, but the more entrenched they become and the more rigid their ideas become and the more there is like a plowing of ideas, the same ideas coming out. That's not good for creativity. And, and for yourselves and for anyone that might watch this, this speech, I would sort of say always find ways to challenge yourself and to let go. And um, there's a great poem and uh, it was written by a guy called Christopher Logue and um, it, I often get this out and sort of you know read this to people when they're leaving the company and it's all emotional or you know someone's like you know worried about where they're going and and frankly I read it to myself every now and then so and it goes like this it goes come to the edge we might fall come to the edge it's too high come to the edge and they came and he pushed and they flew and that sense of letting go I'm convinced will help you fly and not, not fall. Thriving with age. Thriving with age. Okay, so this one is quite personal. Um, this is about me and, um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, I only felt like yesterday I looked like you lot. Um, young, fresh-faced and sort of, you know, um, just, you know, and, and you know, that's, <laughs> where's it all gone? Uh, it goes fast. And, um, and, and, uh, and with that comes um, a lot of change. And, um, and change um, is something which you can't resist. You have to go with it. You have to embrace change. And if you're in the creative world, you know that you're all about creating change. But, you know, what you may create on a computer or on a website or kind of like, you know, on an ad or, you know, in, in science or an experiment or all these things, right, time moves on and new things come along. And the, the, the rate of change today is bewildering. Um, and I begin to sound like my mum. But um, it's positive and you have to stay with change. And what I've noticed with, with, as I've got older is, is that I have changed and I've already mentioned you to, to some of the experiences which have helped sort of shape me. But um, the, the interesting thing that happened to me two years ago was that um, one day I was kind of just outside, um, just doing some mucking around in my garden, and um, I, my, my hearing kind of went in this ear. It kind of just, just in, the, in the space of five minutes, it went from full hearing to nothing. And uh, it was very strange, and, uh, and I thought, oh, that's a bit odd. And um, only the week before, I'd done a big swim, a sponsored swim, so I kind of thought, well, that's an ear infection, and, you know. Um, so I went to see the doctor the next day, and he said, yeah, 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 you've got, a, you've got an ear infection, and uh, take some antibiotics. Um, and the next day, I felt, started to feel very dizzy and uh, really nauseous, and, uh, and uh, so I thought, this isn't right, and, um, and some tinnitus started kicking in. So I went back to the doctor and I said, look, I'm just tell you, I'm feeling really nauseous now. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, there's, the antibiotics don't seem to be working or anything like that. And, um, and, he, and he said, no, 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 it's, it's an infection. It's definitely an infection. And I'm like, okay. 
And uh, so it may take, you know, like 10 days for it to clear. Um, so I battled on for 10 days with tinnitus and, um, you know, the hearing loss in one ear. And it's very strange that when you, if, you, if anyone's ever, like, suffered any kind of, like, physical sort of change, um, you'll know how unbalancing that is. And for me, it was like, you know, quite, you know, quite, quite dramatic. But I thought, well, the effects of the, um, you know, the antibiotics will work. But they didn't. And um, so about two weeks went by, and I just kind of thought, well, this is really getting crazy now. And then I actually had a holiday scheduled, and I went on holiday, and, um, and, it, was, and it was there. And every, I was, for every conversation, I was like, you what? You know, what? I was going to say that again. And then I had to position myself on the, you know, on the, uh, you know, the, the right-hand the right side of the table so I could hear with my left ear. And it was all kind of like weird, and everyone was laughing at me. And there was a doctor on that holiday, and she said, I think you need to go and get that checked out because it's that's not right. And so I kind of like, she confirmed what I kind of um, was feeling, which was that it really needs to be checked out. And I went to see a doctor, a specialist um, in hearing, and he said, oh, you've got, um, you've got uh, sudden um, hearing loss um, of, the, of the brain. And he said, I don't know if you know this, but you don't actually hear with your ear, you hear with your brain. And, um, and the, the, all the ear does is conduct the sound and it goes through into your brain and your brain, where your ear meets your brain, there's these little fine hair cells. And uh, those little hair cells are what sort of trigger sound and go into, and your brain decodes that and like reprograms it as, as noise in your head. And he said, um, what you're suffering from is a very, is a one in a hundred thousand situation. And if we don't do something dramatic, then you won't get your hearing back, you lost it. So, um, my body had changed, and um, we, we tried some drastic uh, measures. We had to, I had to have steroid injections through your eardrum, which is not a nice experience, probably one of the worst things I've ever had done over, over five days. And we got a little bit of it back. I got my bass notes back. Uh, but my top notes, which is a bit like a speaker, the tweeter's gone, and the mid-range speaker is all kind of distorted, but uh, the bass is there. So basically, if I cover this ear up, it's all a muffle from this ear. So um, my... My body had changed, and, um, and I, to this day I live with tinnitus, it's raging all the time. Uh, Laurie, who works with me, has this unfortunate sort of um, job of sitting to the, the side of me, so whenever she asks me a question, I never hear her, so she feels like she's ignored by me most of the time. Um, so, um, what does this all mean? It means that if this is about thriving with age, and yet here I am and my body's changing, um, uh, you know, what, what, where's the thriving there? And I think really the, 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 the lesson of freedom for me here is that you've got to kind of roll with what's, what throws at you. It's not, you know, change doesn't just happen in your life, um, in your mind when you're doing creativity. It will come at you in all sorts of ways that you can't control. And human nature really is to resist change. Um, you know, if you're all creative people, you will all know um, what I'm sort of talking about, because you live in the world of creativity, but no doubt you will have encountered resistance to change when you're either presenting it, or you will see people that you know are closed-minded and are, are not very kind of open to change. And I, all I would say is, is that this actually hasn't held me back. Um, I've lost the ability to hear my son play music, which I really uh, love. He's a brilliant, gifted musician. I know I'm never going to hear him play perfectly. but. It hasn't stopped me from continuing doing the things I've loved. In actual fact, it's actually spurred me on to try new and ridiculous things. And as you get older, I think the thing to remember is you don't have to become old these days and then fit into a cliché. You can actually be free to do whatever you want and work around the limitations that sort of get, get imposed on you. So what I would say is, is that in terms of a point of freedom, change, it can actually liberate you because it is your only constant companion in life. It's the one thing that will stay with you from start to finish. And if you resist change, um, I'm afraid it's going to become your enemy. So the way I look at change is I see change as your constant companion. And, um, and what I would say is, is that you should run with change and let it be your friend and, uh, and thrive with change and not resist it. The pitch. The pitch. Uh, keeping an eye on the clock here. Um, okay, the pitch. Um, you know, creatives in all um, walks of life, I think, really have this kind of, um, you know, this, this kind of, uh, this horrible situation where you have to, like, 
you know, come up, come up against uh, in a competitive situation, you know, winning business. And I find it the most kind of like, you know, depressing and, and actually kind of ridiculous kind of part of the creative process because anyone that thinks it's clever to make people, you know, pitch for a piece of business is kind of actually taking one of the most important aspects of the challenge and, and devaluing it by turning it into some kind of like lottery or competition. And, um, and the way people approach pitches, I think, uh, is, to, um, is to kind of like also adds to that process. So pitching is, a, is something that as I, I don't really like doing. Uh, we try and talk people out of doing it. But the best kind of pitching involves daring. And, and I think if you're going to go for something, you've got to go for it on a big scale. You've got to redefine what you're going for, because otherwise you're just going to be, you're going to like be part of the crowd, all competing for the same thing. And, um, and there was a project I was once asked to work for by uh, Coca-Cola, and it was uh, for a project uh, called Coke Experiences. And we were one of like the usual sort of like six agencies, and, and it was, uh, you know, we all had to supply a proposal by so-and-so date. And it was about, the project was about how could Coca-Cola provide experiences. And, um, and so uh, that, um, we sat down and we thought, how are we going to win this project? Because we don't know anything about um, experiences. And then we thought, actually, um, the solution, um, and this was brought up by a woman that works for me in New York, a lady called Tess, she said, why don't we give Coke an experience and, and, and win the project on that basis? And then we just thought, well, okay, well, let's run with this idea. How big can this be, this, this experience that we give them? So we knew the name of the woman that was running the project. We knew that she was based in Atlanta. We were in London. And we thought, how do you give someone an experience? And so basically, we orchestrated um, probably you know, what you would call like a digital media campaign. And this was like 10 years ago. And um, we didn't know what we were doing. And we set up fake websites around the world. And we were all targeting this one woman, so that um, sending her messages on a daily basis from around the world. And it was the first time we were using digital media in a way that was kind of like, it was free. And it was like, wow, we can do that. And we were targeting this one woman. And every day, we sent her a message, which gave her a small experience until it grew and grew and grew, until she was getting positive experiential messages and photographs um, from around the world, um, all orchestrated by us. But she didn't know it was from us. Um, and then on the last day, um, we flew our creator director to Atlanta. And we started taking photographs of him at Atlanta, at Atlanta airport. And he was wearing a t-shirt with her name on it. And that was posted on various websites. And so then she knew that somebody was in like um, Atlanta. Um, and then he went outside the Coca-Cola building. Well, you imagine what that was like with this woman's name on his t-shirt, um, asking, you know, are you Catherine Stone? And you imagine how high security that would be. Um, some random person wearing a Coca-Cola employee's name on a, on a yellow t-shirt um, outside. And, and every now and then a bit of luck happens. And this car came past and screeched to a halt. And this guy jumped out. And he said, he said who are you? Who are you? And, and Sean said, well, I'm, you know, I'm Sean. I'm from Pearl Fisher. And I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to present our proposal by tomorrow. He said, you're driving Catherine nuts. She doesn't know who, which agency you are, but she's loving every second of it. And, um, and you, know, you know, what's your game plan? And Sean said, well, the game plan is, is that she might drive by. And then I kind of like give her the proposal. He said, I got a much better idea. I'm going to meet her. I'm going to take her for lunch tomorrow. And we'll meet you at this bar. And you can, you can come up to her and give the proposal in hand. So a little bit of we made our own luck. And the next day, exactly that happened. Sean was in the bar. Catherine walked in with this other guy. And Sean was there wearing a t-shirt saying, are you Catherine Stone? And she just, she kind of screamed because she didn't know how this had all happened. And she ran over to him and said, tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. And he said, I'm, you know, I'm Sean from Pearl Fisher. And uh, this is our proposal for, your, for the, the Coke experience. And you've just had a Pearl Fisher experience. And she took the proposal. And she gave us the project there and then. We won it that way. So. If you're going to pitch for something, break the rules. Dare to be free. And um, free with your mind. Never pitch for free, but always pitch an idea that frees up the possibilities. And it may also free up a massive budget as well. Just say no. Just say no. Uh, it's a kind of a related story. I'm going to get through this one quite fast, because um, I might have to wrap this up soon. But saying no is a really positive thing. Um, again, this is a kind of like a professional thing. Uh, we were asked by McDonald's to pitch on a project once, and uh, a long time ago. And uh, basically, uh, the, the, the brief that they were giving us um, 
was in conflict with their values. So we had a brief and they sent their values. And not only that, it was an 11-way pitch. There was no way we were going to win it. And it was, there was no money on it as well. And, um, and we just thought, you know what? It may be McDonald's and one of the biggest iconic brand in the world, but we're not going to work for them. So um, they also were expecting like some kind of like automated email proposal back by you know July the 11th. And um, so on that day, actually, what we did, we sent them back a self-presenting presentation uh, that said, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in your pitch, but we're going to say no. And these are the reasons why. And we told them why their brief was wrong. And we told them that it was in conflict with their corporate and company values. We told them that, um, that food and health was moving in a different direction to the way that the way that, that brand was going and what they were doing was, was unhealthy both from a moral point of view and from a, a societal point of view. And, and if they wanted to work with us, we, the way that we would solve that brief would be to tune into these uh, the, the massive shifts that we could see taking place in, in food culture, society, and so on. And, and if they wanted to do the brief properly, they would change the brief and they'd do it on those terms. Thank you very much, McDonald's. Press send. So that went off to like you know, corporate headquarters and we never heard anything back. Um, and um, so kind of like, you know, I guess that's sort of, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, where the story sort of ends. But it doesn't end there because um, two years later we got a phone call from McDonald's and we had some high and mighty PA was on the phone and she was saying, you know, I want you to, I want to set up a conference call with uh, you know, Jean-Jacques, somebody other, and, uh, and he wants to talk to you and uh, it's very important that you're all on the line. And so, you know, the three partners got on the line and this, this conference came in, it's a conference call from some very high uh, chief marketing officer at Coke at the time. And he started off by saying, I don't know if you remember, but you, two years ago, you sent a presentation to us about why you wouldn't work with us. It was like, e yeah. And he said, uh, that became one of the most talked about agency presentations we ever got. And, um, and what it did is it, we, we did the project and it was a failure, just as you predicted it would be. And, and so actually we want to do a new project and we just want to work with you on that. Would you still want to work with us? And we said, well, is the brief in line with your values and where things are going? And it was, and it was like, yes. And it was like, fine, let's do business together. And so I think really the, kind of the, the thing for me is, is that saying no is the biggest aphrodisiac, actually. Um, it, will, uh, it, will, it will open up much more possibilities than you can possibly imagine. I want a quick time check here. It's quarter two. Do I have to wrap this up now? How many more times have you got? I, I can't remember. Did you want to stop now or do you want to keep going? We can add that one and then. What, should we do the. Do you the want to finish on the one that you really like? Um, I don't know. I can't remember how many there are. We can do that one. We can do that. Uh, oh, we got. Fly me, we've got five. The power incarceration is quite an emotional one. Oh dear, okay, well, I, well no, I tried, I said I'd, I'd promised myself I would try things I haven't done before uh, as part of the process of freedom. So, incarceration. So, this is about the power of creativity. I'm going to do this one and I'm going to do a fun one after this one. Um, so, um, so, I think, you know, through life you sort of go through experiences, your own and others, and you sort of see kind of like, you know, uh, how other people sort of suffer. And uh, suffering is not a nice thing. I might not make it through this one. Um, but my dad was, uh, you know, dearly loved by me. And, um, you know, he had quite a few problems in his life. He was an alcoholic and uh, he was uh, depressive. But he was actually probably one of the most humane people I've ever known. And, um, and anyway, he had um, a few mental breakdowns. And uh, he came back once he was taken away for, uh, I don't know, four weeks or something like that. And when he came back, and I was about 10 at the time, this wonderful coffee table came with him. And, um, and the coffee table was actually a mosaic. It was just beautiful. And, uh, and I said to Dad, where did you get that from? And he said, I made that. And uh, I was like, what do you mean you made that? You know, it was like a 10-year-old kid watching your dad, who was a, a teacher, um, struggling in life, um, you know, doing the best he could. And he wasn't, you know, a bad man in any way, but he just had these problems. And there was this beautiful coffee table. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I, I never figured out how he'd made it. And he said he'd made it. And I believed him. And I didn't figure that out until a lot later on in life when uh, my daughter um, suffered from uh, leukemia. And uh, if anyone um, 
has ever been with somebody who's terminally ill. It's quite a challenging time in your life. And um, she was in Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is nearby, and, um, and she was there for two years. And, um, <clears throat> and in that time, she had to live in a room much smaller than this. It was about kind of, I don't know, like five metres by five metres, and she, she couldn't go out. And, um, and the only thing that she could do was be creative. And a, a five-year-old kid is um, naturally creative. And uh, this is the only thing she had in her life. So um, <clears throat> I sat with her, and we used to get plasticine out, and we used to make these horses, the plasticine horses. And um, it, was, um, it was the only thing that really made her happy in that time. And she loved it, and we did it over and over again. So what that made me realize was actually what Dad had been through, which was creativity had actually helped him an awful lot. OK myself together. <laughs> you can laugh, it's fine. Um, and then it reminded me of Matisse. So when Matisse was in, uh, you know, the last <coughs> decades of his life, you know, he was incarcerated and he couldn't paint in the way he used to. And so he started cutting things out of paper. And then we have that wonderful Matisse exhibition. So incarceration is a limitation and it locks you away. Um, but it doesn't really because your mind can be free and creativity can set you free. So, if any of you ever suffer from some form of incarceration or deprivation of any kind, just remember that, um, that simple pleasures um, can really thrive from that situation. And, um, and they can not only thrive, they can heal and they can survive. And that is the power of creativity. So I've got to do a funny one to end with. <laughs> so let's have a show uh, the boards again because I can't end like this. Um, okay, I'm going to do this one. Let your spirit guide you. So, um, last story. And then, uh, so basically, my creative team, I love them to bits and they are, um, you know, they're a great bunch. They all look like you. They're very trendy and they kind of like, they all, you know, do great things. Um, but they can get a bit like stuck in their ways. And, um, and so I sort of try and find ways to sort of unlock them. They're sort of like the way they look at things so we don't end up getting like the same look over and over again. And I think we've succeeded over the years. I think the body of work that we've produced is actually very distinctive and um, in, its own, in, each, in each right. And part of that is about keeping your mind fresh. So um, one day I just thought, well, we've got to, got to get them out of the studio. We've got to get them away from like steel floors like this and laptops and this kind of stuff and we're going to go for a creative couple of days and uh, so I set this whole thing up and um, and it was it was um, they didn't know what they were doing but they came to my house in Dorset and we all sort of drove down in cars and they just thought it was going to be like you know oh, going to the boss's house and we have some beer and chat and like you know just like you know forget the creative stuff but oh no when they arrived at my house um, and they all got out of the cars and they were all wearing their trendy gear and everything like that and they you know they they were welcomed by an American Indian, a woman, um, and she was wearing complete American Indian gear, and uh, she was actually introduced to them as a shaman. Does anyone know what a shaman is? I've got a few nods, okay, so a shaman. And uh, an American Indian shaman. And, um, and so they got out of their cars, and they were like, all of a sudden, there's, a, there's an American Indian, a shaman, and she's greeting them in traditional American Indian style. She's chalking, well, she's taking charcoal, and she's putting it across their foreheads. And then we all um, we all uh, were then welcomed into the wigwam or the teepee that was that was kind of like on the lawn just around the corner that they couldn't see. So everyone, you know, you imagine like 15 designers and strategists all going into like a wigwam, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, and like what is going on? And it was a total ripping apart of their circumstances, and um, uh, you know, their, their sort of their world. And and what we did was a series of. Um, um, American Indian uh, shamanistic um, exercises, and um, and this, this this title of the story is "Let Your Spirit Guide You." There's a sort of a wordplay in there because actually we were taken on a on a on a on a journey to meet two things: our spirit guides and our power animals. And shamans believe that you have a spirit guide, so, uh, someone that's guiding you through life, and that you also have an, a power animal. There is a there is a 
you know, a, a being, a, a, an animal presence, which is your, which is the kind of that gives you your particular power, and that you can, and if you can tune into it, you can harness those kind of energies and travel and use that in your life. But you weren't thinking I was going to talk about this this morning, and. Um, Anyway, and the way you, 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 you discover who your power guide is and your, your, your spirit guide and your power animal is, is that you go through a lot of drum banging and a lot of chanting, a lot of like hallucinations with no drugs involved. It's just in your imagination working and you're being taken somewhere on a journey and you discover, um, you know, who your kind of, um, who your, 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 your spirit guide um, is. And, um, and, and that it was interesting to me because what it did was uh, really kind of like loosen up my mind and and uh, and everyone else's mind and uh, and think about things in a way that you possibly couldn't imagine and I discovered that my power animal was a bird of prey and I've actually used that um, a lot in the way that I think about things because I know that I am actually at, at, I am struggle most when I'm in the detail when I can see the big picture I'm flying and I'm, and I'm, you know, and that's the way I feel most comfortable. So I guess if you want to think outside the box, um, you need to release yourself from the image of the box because the box, just thinking about a box as a box as a box, is always going to make you think of the same um, solution. So if you want to free your mind, redefine what it is that you're trying to get outside of, and open your mind up to the possibilities. So it's, uh, I think we just run out, run out of time. Um, well, um, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much.